Today on the stream, a country that has endured decades of armed violence that has resulted in the deaths of at least six million people. Conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo is often overlooked, but today we are looking at the impact of the fight between the government and armed groups, and in particular, M23. Some of what you will see may well be distressing. I want to let you know that before we go any further in this program. We start with a survivor of a massacre in Kishishi. That massacre was in November of last year. The survivor told his story just a few months ago. Let's have a look. Let's have a listen. All the men who are in the church, you pretend to be displaced persons, but you are the rebels who shot at us. So they took all the men back to a banana plantation and they said, sit here and put your feet in the hole, stand in a circle around the hole. And they started shooting them and they started killing the others next to them when the first hole was already filled. That's what happened. We were surprised. There is no one but God who can help us. So much to talk about helping us do that. Kambali Musavuli, welcome to the stream. Kambali is a human rights activist from the Democratic Republic of Congo and an analyst at the Center for Research on Congo, Kinshasa. Thanks for joining us. From Goma in eastern DR Congo, we have Ruth Omar Esther. She's a freelance journalist. And in Washington, D.C., Karine Kaniza Naturia is a Deputy Africa Director at Human Rights Watch. It's good to have all of you. I wish it was under better circumstances. If I say M23 to you, Ruth, first things that come to mind, and then Kambali, first things that come to mind. Ruth, you start. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, if you say M23 to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is... Um, trouble and conflict that has never had an end. Kambalik, continue. The M23 is a acronym, right, of an agreement signed by the Congress government with an armed group called the CNDP in 2012, right? In 2012, that's when they created the name of and it, it. And it, M23 stands for March 23rd. 23rd. Yeah, on March right. 23rd, 2009, mm -hmm. uh, the Congolese government signed a, an agreement with the rebel group CNDP uh, that made them actually put down the guns. In 2012, they went back in the bush saying that the Congolese government did not abide by the agreement. But few things happened during that time. It's not just that the agreement was not uh, followed through by the government, but there was something else happening at the time, which was the arrest of Bosco Tanganda, the push to arrest arrest a former rebel leader of, the, uh, of that same group, who is currently at the ICC. And during that push to arrest him, that's when the M23 was created. So anytime I hear the M23, I always say that it's masking actually the nature of the rebel force that exists, which is a continuation of uh, existing rebel force in the Congo who are proxy rebels supported by neighboring countries. Karine, this is exactly why it's difficult for the international community to follow what is going on in the DRC. It seems from the outside to be incredibly complex. If I say to you M23, what would you summarize back for me and for the international community? Thanks for the question. I think as um my co-panelist just said, I think it's, um, it's M23 speaks to a history of failed implementation of peace mm. agreements. Yeah. It speaks to uh, the regional dynamics, the proxy wars that neighboring countries, uh, namely Uganda, Rwanda, um, have been, have been uh, 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 exerting. But most importantly, it's the chaos and the mass atrocities, the war crimes that have been committed, and the impact on the civilian population. Um, uh, I think about the women and the girls we interviewed um, in, the, in the context of our latest reports, um, women who told us that the, the tragedies they went through um, and, and, and how they were for instance, raped in front of uh, their children and their, and their husbands, um, the shame that goes with it. Um, it's also the devastation, the humanitarian crisis that we're seeing unfolding. It's also the lack of political will. It's a region that has, that has not been able to uh, master uh, a coordinated action 
to end a cycle, the cycle of abuses, and hold perpetrators accountable. There's so many fails along this route that takes us from 2012 right up to date, Kambale. I'm just going to help our audience just do a very quick timeline. So we start in 2012, just so they can keep up with where we are right now. Um, so March 23rd, this movement um, is a Congolese Tutsi militia. This goes back to the Rwanda genocide. So the roots go back to there. But in 2012, M23 were in Eastern Congo and they seized the capital of North Kivu province. A collection of the Congolese army, the UN troops, uh, fought them. The group eventually signed a peace deal, and that was in 2013. Fighting has intensified since 2021, and again, M23 back in North Kivu. And then while it has withdrawn from some parts of that province in eastern Congo, its members continue to attack civilians. Ruth, why? What do they want? Well, exactly. Uh, the M23 always say that they stand on the agreement that they have with the Congolese government. But uh, the Congolese government have done everything in order to make them seize all the, all the crimes and everything they have been doing in the eastern part of Congo. But this is not happening. But also we have the one issue, which is um, the Rwandan government backing the M23. So that's where this issue becomes a little bit complex because the M23 is not working on its own. It has support from the Rwandan government. I want to show you a, a quote that we got just before we went on air from the Rwanda government via their embassy in Washington, D.C. So this is Kia. Uh, Kambali, respond to this. Rwanda is not going to be intimidated by these Human Rights Watch campaigns of disinformation and distractions from ongoing regional peace efforts. Karine, I know you're ready <laughs> to talk about that, but let me just go to Kambale first of all. This was an instant reaction today, no prompting. We, we, do, not, we do not agree with the allegations that Rwanda is involved in backing M23. What do we know for sure? The, on June 13th of this, of this month, uh, the UN Group of Experts published a report that includes aerial footages and uh, photographic evidence of the Rwanda Defense Forces inside of the DRC. Uh, they even included uh, the names of Rwandan officials, uh, Rwandan army officials involved in the support of the M23. In that documentation, uh, they listed the names, right? Uh, they got the information from their own army. They got the information from uh, intelligence services in the region. So in terms of evidence that already exists, um, we are beyond allegations now. Uh, we are uh, beyond accusations. The reason why, for the past two decades, the DRC has lost six million uh, people. Which is a shocking that you would even say six million. What conflict in the world creates six million casualties, Indeed. deaths? Indeed. It's because there is a culture of impunity in DRC, but cultural impunity can only end with justice. Because when we had six million people dead in Europe, a different action was taken. In DRC, there is a proposal of having an international tribunal for DRC. That's not being implemented. We know the perpetrators. We know nations destabilizing the Congo. But no punitive actions is taken. We mm -hmm. hear condemnation. Uh, a few days ago, the United States put out a statement uh, con uh, around the UN re uh, report. How, saying, how, how how are statements? How helpful are statements? A strong statement for the United States. What does that do? How many lives does that save? After two decades, it doesn't. But right. in the case of the United, uh, the United States, we don't need the statement anymore. What we need is the action, actually implementing their own law. The difference with the United States is that they actually have a law on the DRC, Public Law 109456, the Democratic Republic of Congo Relief Security Democracy Promotion Act of 2006, written by Barack Obama, signed by George Bush in 2006. This law clearly states in Section 105 that the Secretary of State, which is today uh, Secretary Blinken, has the power to withhold aid to any nation destabilizing the Congo. So this is actually a US law. Secretary Blinken, in his visit in DRC a few, a few years ago, he himself said that the evidence presented by the United Nations Group of Experts is credible. Yet, they failed to implement so their own law. So diplomacy is failing. Uh, Karine, let me just bring you in here. Just a moment ago, I showed a Human Rights Watch page here. 
DR Congo, mass graves tied to Rwanda backed M23. You don't even say allegedly allegedly backed, um, tied to Rwanda backed M23. You know this for sure, Karine. Karine. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can. Go ahead. Thanks. Now, just, just to say that Human Rights Watch conducted over 100 interviews in person in Goma and over the phone between March and May. Um, as I mentioned, we, we published two, uh, two investigations. Um, we documented unlawful killings, cases of rape by M23 fighters uh, between October and March in different localities um, in the Masiri and, uh, and uh, Ruchuru territories. Um, we documented cases of explosive weapons uh, uh, which injured and killed civilians um, in, uh, in Masisi. Um, in Kishishi, we documented the presence of at least 14 mass graves, cases of executions. Um, and, and, but we've also found um, between May and August 2022, how the Congolese army, uh, and that goes to some of the issues that Kambali raised, uh, the Congolese army with a, with a coalition of Congolese militia as well as the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda, FDLR, uh, by its acronym, um, have committed uh, serious crimes, including rape, uh, and, have, and have triggered uh, ethnic hatred against uh, 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 Tutsi communities. Uh, all that to say that uh, obviously we take note of the of the statement that the Rwandan government has has, has put out. Um, it's a, I almost want to say that it's a familiar position to be uh, to be in, not not just vis-a-vis -vis the Rwandan government, but other governments. Uh, when you do investigation on human rights violations, whether they are Africans or Western governments, um, so that is um, that goes without saying that uh, obviously we our documentation has. Uh, uh, uncovered uh, uh, serious crimes. Uh, we are calling for uh, forensic uh, preservation of evidence. We're calling for uh, an end uh, to the support uh, to M23. We're calling for a, uh, a human rights due diligence policy to be within uh, the regional force deployment, the East African uh, community deployment uh, that is ongoing. Um, and, 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 and finally, uh, we're really uh, calling on regional human rights institutions such as the UN or the African Commission on Human and People's Rights to carry out investigation I and mean, to pronounce I hear themselves. the call, but after 20 years, is anyone listening? Well, they should be, and we shall continue All right, let me, calling Ruth, on them. Ruth, I want to bring in a fellow a journalist. Her name is Wendy Bashi. It is not just Rwanda who is involved in the instability of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Many more interests are involved as well. Wendy Bashi spelt it out. I'd love you to pick up on the back of what she says and tell us more. Here's Wendy, first of all. Today, the interest of Uganda and, uh, and Rwanda in the DRC uh, can be put on one aspect. I mean, for me, it's the economic aspect. As we all know, uh, the DRC is very rich. Uh, the country has gold, diamond, uranium, cobalt, and many other things. And these facts can be one of the reasons why many other countries, it's not only Rwanda and Uganda, uh, many other countries in the Great Lakes are really interested uh, in taking power and control of uh, the DRC. Ruth, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, uh, what Wendy is saying, as uh, she's talking about um, Uganda and Rwanda, yeah, till now, I mean, until now we have evidence that Rwanda is being backed by, is been backing the M23 and contributing to the conflict that is happening in the Eastern, in, in, in the North Kivu. But when it comes to Uganda, uh, the Congolese government has not been very clear about the position that Uganda has in this conflict. Because, uh, I mean, I think what the Congolese uh, government have has vis-a-vis -vis Uganda is uh, a security interest. Because if we look at, for example, the Operation Shijada that is being uh, held by the UPDF together with the Congolese army in the provinces of Ituri and North Kivu, um, they are fighting against the, AD, uh, the ADF. 
So, I mean, the Congolese uh, government has not yet said clearly what the position of Uganda is in this conflict. But also there are testimonies from the civil society who are telling, saying who are in the ground in those regions which are were occupied by the M23 rebel. They've been saying that they used to see uh, the presence of, uh, of different um, um, soldiers of, of the neighboring countries. Testimonies are there. But for now, evidence shows that Rwanda is the one backing the M23 movement. But when it comes to other neighboring countries, the Congolese government hasn't, has, hasn't said it clearly. Okay. All right. So on YouTube, I've just some thoughts here from our viewers. Uh, Areta says Rwanda and the DRC, domestic matter, but the bigger picture and the root cause is about their rich minerals. Is this about money? Kambale. It is about resources. And that's yeah. been the history of the Congo since its mother they found in 1885, when yeah. King Leopold uh, got control of the DRC. Oh, you're taking us way back. It was actually for rubber that was yeah. used for the car, uh, the tires of our yeah. cars and bicycles, right? Mm -hmm. We go to 1945. Without Congo's uranium, you couldn't have Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sure. That was under Belgian hands. Today, from 96 to present, Congo's minerals has been at the center of modern day technology. You won't have your cell phone, yeah. your laptops, and so on without Congo's minerals. But what's important to see and to connect it back to what has happened in Kishishe is that the crimes in Kishishe, it's not the first time it happens. It has happened for two decades. In 1998, massacres documented by UN group of experts, Roberto Garretan, where 200,000 civilians presumably were killed or disappeared, so happened. So naively, as you t you're going to list atrocities for us. Mm -hmm. Why kill civilians? It's a tactic of displacement. Whenever you okay. are massacring civilians uh, in public, raping women in public, those things are to terrorize the population. When it happens in your community, tomorrow you are not going to be in the same area because you are afraid. We have mass displacement, over 5 million in some estimates, from 2 to 5 million internally displaced Congolese. But after a few days, few months, a few years, you are seeing development of mining uh, concessions in those areas. Oh, because right? you clear the people out? Not only mining concessions, oh, you also goodness. have dispossession of land where right. population are taking over the land. But for that to end, and that's where, at least for Sarek, where we are standing is, until there is justice, there cannot be peace. So we are signing peace agreement and peace agreement mm -hmm. with people who committed a crime yesterday. CNDP massacre civilians in Kiwanja, raped women in Kiwanja in 2008. It's not surprising to me, CNDP, which is now called M23, to rape women in Kishishe. They've done that before. But what has happened around accountability and the agreement that they signed in 2008 mm -hmm. gave them amnesty. And that's why also some of the, the implementation yeah, of yeah. agreement becomes a problem. How do you give a rebel leader, a, a battalion, amnesty for raping women? How do you implement that, right? So that becomes a much more complex. But we don't believe that just dealing with the M23 is the solution. It has to be dealt with at the regional level. We run that in Uganda. In 2012, the stopping of M23 was through diplomatic measure. What actually happened? The United States withheld aid to Rwanda. That was a diplomatic measure. In 2013, we saw the M23 disappear pretty much by saying that they're, they're going to cease fire. A decade later, they are coming back. But the same measure taken in 2012 is not what's happening now. There seems right, to be some form of fatigue around diplomacy. Kambali, so take a pause for a moment. A couple can of I... things that I want to share with you. Colin, you go first, I'll go second. How, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to echo what Kambali just said and, 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 and just to reinforce the fact that currently, uh, in, two in 2021, we see uh, uh, President Chisekedi approving a plan to build roads linking uh, Uganda to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to Congo. And uh, some, obviously, analysis uh, have been made around the fact that that is also a driving factor in the, in the regional, in the regional uh, dynamics. Um, Uganda's escalating military and economic engagement in the DRC, because while these roads are being constructed, there was there's a deployment of the UPDF. Um, you have, obviously, UN reports uh, that show that some of the DRCs, Colton, for instance, end up in Rwanda, but also a significant amount is diverted to Uganda via Bunagana, yeah. um, where the first uh, the first incursion of the M uh, M23 happened. Uh, so, obviously, you have all these 
the nexus between conflict, minerals, uh, uh, the rebel groups and, and foreign backers that has really faced Congo for decades now. All right. Um, so, so, Karine, let me bring in some, some, some more voices into our conversation, just so our audience hear from some other people who are also involved. The UNHCR sent us a couple of thoughts. This one was really important about displacement. And Kampali has already framed, well, why would you move so many people out of the way? Well, to get to the minerals, here's Angeli. The current situation of displacement in the DRC is appallingly overwhelming. It is a situation whereby we have some 6.3 million internally displaced people. The single difference with refugees is that they did not cross an international boundary. But we have 523,000 plus uh, refugees originating from neighboring countries. We have more than one million Congolese who are refugees in neighboring countries. A huge displaced people refugee crisis that is not making the headlines every day. And why are we talking about this today? Because of the humanitarian crisis, the sexual violence. I want you to key and I warned you earlier about one person's experience because this one person is many people in Eastern Congo. Have a listen, have a look. <laughs> Because of the crisis we have in the camp, two weeks ago I went looking for wood like the other women do, to sell it so that I could buy salt and soap. But there we found four men armed with machetes. We fled, but I tripped on a stone and fell down. Three of these men followed my two friends, and the last one had stayed with me and raped me. I couldn't scream because he told me that if I screamed, he would kill me with his machete. So as there's an uptick in the violence from M23, the United Nations Secretary General was asked about, well, where is M23 getting their weapons from? And this is what he told a, friend, a France 24 interview. And the answer is in what he doesn't say. Let's have a look. As you're aware, the reason for these recent demonstrations is the fact that the United Nations is not able to defeat the M23. But the truth is that the M23 today is a modern army with heavy equipment that is more advanced than the equipment of MONUSCO. And this equipment, does it come from Rwanda? They come from somewhere. You seem to say yes. They come from somewhere, somewhere nearby. They were not born in the forest. They come from somewhere. Karine, on YouTube, one of our viewers says that I've noticed this issue in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Nobody is held accountable for the murders. Karine, bearing in mind the Human Rights Watch report, how is accountability achieved? Where does the justice come from? I think justice should come first from duty bearers. It's the Congolese government and it's the Rwandan government. Um, it also comes from a concerted effort to put pressure on both governments um, to investigate the abuses that not just Human Rights Watch, but other institutions, including, including the UN a group of experts, have documented. Um, you mentioned the, the humanitarian sit, uh, situation, which is horrible. Um, when, you, when you hear organizations like MSF uh, say that they've provided care to 674 survivors of sexual violence in the, in two weeks, mm -hmm. in the last two weeks in April, um, when you hear about camps for 15,000 people. Corinne, um, you yes? have one sentence to finish your thought. Go ahead. We're at the end of the show. Sorry. Um, just to say that accountability is a must to break the cycle of abuse mm -hmm. and actually start unfolding and implementing an agenda that will securize, that will provide security Thank to you. civilians. Thank you to Kareen, to Ruth, to Kambale, and to our viewers watching on YouTube and around the world. I'll see you next time. Take care.